Um, you've probably, uh, probably, hopefully, some of you are coming to this thinking that the free trade agreement um, represents the injection into uh, economies and, and global um, opportunity that, that we need right now. Um, or some may be on the skeptical side and think that it's a unwelcome distraction as, as economists try to get back on their feet um, post COVID. Um, however, it cannot be denied that a $2.5 trillion market awaits us with the uh, free trade agreement recently being ratified, the appointment of the Secretariat in Accra, um, and all that it promises to bring from industrialization to new markets to diversification of economies, growth, um, and jobs critically for, for you of today. Um, but most of all, although all of that is very exciting, what, what truly excites us at Invest in Africa is the global statement this makes at a time when the world is retracting and retrenching and increasingly looking inwards, here is an opportunity for Africa to uh, lead on a global stage and make an ambitious statement about what can be achieved by working together, what can be achieved through collaboration, um, and really put a stake in the ground and say, this is what we're aiming for. Um, and, and to make a statement that investment and trade um, does not have to be a zero-sum game or a race to the bottom, um, as it increasingly has felt in the recent years. Um, and that there will be win-wins across Africa as the free trade agreement takes shape. Um, but perhaps most importantly of all, for, for me, I feel at least, is the uh, inspirational message that sends out to the youth in Africa um, that this can be done um, and that there is a pan-African marketplace out there waiting for them. Um, we're particularly excited by that message at Invest in Africa because preparing local African businesses for growth and opportunities um, is what we do all day every day. We're very focused on SMEs um, and getting them ready to access um, contracts, finance, race standards um, and understands what it takes to do business not only globally and, and internationally, but on a pan-African stage. So the Africa Free Trade Agreement, we think, is very timely uh, and very welcome. And we look forward to hearing a lot more about it today. Um, and I think with that, it's time to get started. I'm going to hand you over to Omar um, and our fantastic panel. And we hope you enjoy the, the webinar. Thank you, William, for those uh, great introductory remarks. I should point out that uh, William heads uh, Invest in Africa. I'm an ambassador at Invest in Africa, which means that uh, we collaborate on certain issues. And one issue that uh, William is very passionate about is local content. So, uh, so creating those uh, those local value chains, and uh, and this is why uh, the AFCFTA is extremely important to William and uh, to SMEs in Africa in terms of the potential that it can hopefully unlock. So I'll start by introducing our panelists. Uh, you've all received the mailers, so we won't uh, dwell too much uh, on who on, on their backgrounds. However, it's important that uh, you know the structure of uh, and why they've been chosen, the structure of this particular panel. So we've got uh, two people who have been um, actively involved in aid and negotiations, and also making sure that the private sector perspective and uh and the voice of the private sector is uh, always taken into account within uh, the negotiation process and uh in putting the uh the framework and the structures of the african hotel free trade agreement uh, in place so we've got uh, mr silver ogical who's currently the chief of staff to his excellency uh wamkele mene who heads the afcfta secretariat uh, but more importantly, actually, Mr. Ojakul uh, from, Uganda, from Uganda has been actively involved in the negotiation process since inception. So uh, he knows the ins and outs of uh, the FCFTA and also what's uh, been involved in terms of the negotiations. Uh, you may know uh, our next panelist that I'm going to introduce, Edem uh, Azogenu, who's uh, heads, the founder of uh, Afro Champions. Edem was, uh, was instrumental in uh, getting that private sector engagement in everything to do with uh, the AFCFTA. Uh, to give us a macro perspective of the current situation in Africa, what this could mean uh, in terms of opportunities, is Razia Khan who's uh, MD and Chief Economist for Africa and the Middle East at Standard Chartered Bank. Um, and uh, she's, I don't know where she gets the time, but she's read over 50 books this year. 
uh, I'm told uh, a dozen of those were fiction, so uh, all the rest were uh, were to do with uh, geopolitics, macroeconomics, and uh, and other things uh, financial. So uh, Raja will be able to uh, give us uh, a great overview, and she's one of the most renowned and most respected uh, economists that we have uh, in Africa, and our uh, rightly chosen in 2015 as uh, one of the most hundred most influential Africans. Yes, what she says moves markets. Um, next is uh, another private sector player, and, and uh, this is a great uh, person to have on board, actually. It's uh, Monica Musonde, uh, who's a founder and CEO of Java Foods. So uh, she's got, uh, Monica's got a phenomenal CV. She's uh, worked with the best out there, and she was uh, an advisor to... Um, to Alika Dangotti working as uh, his, chief, uh, his chief counsel when uh, Dangotti was not as well known as he is today and, uh, and maneuvering and growing his business. So uh, she then went back and uh, as an entrepreneur started her own company and she actually lives uh, on a daily basis the, uh, the challenges of, uh, of trade. She imports, she exports, brings, uh, brings good from, uh, from South Africa exports goods to uh, Malawi and other, um, and other neighboring countries. So uh, she knows the reality. One thing is the theory, the other thing is the reality. And last but not least is uh, a longstanding friend and uh, what I, uh, who I consider being the uh, chief deal maker in, uh, in Africa uh, from Cameroon, Rene Awambe, but who works as global head of client relations at AfriEx in Bank. So um, I've never seen such a, an an effective and uh, uh, I wouldn't call it ambitious, but uh, determined uh, deal maker. He's uh, brought literally millions of dollars of uh, foreign capital into the uh, into the continent. And at the Afrix in Bank, uh, he's part of a management team that is working relentlessly and tirelessly to creating the platforms that will enable. Uh, trade to uh, effectively trade uh, to, to effectively take place. What do I mean by that? They're creating a uh, payments uh, clearing uh, platform so that uh, so that someone in Ghana can can clear in um, can clear goods purchased from uh, from Egypt in local currency, and for his uh, counterpart in Egypt to receive it in local currency. Thus. Um, thus not needing to go through uh, euros, dollars, uh, uh, or other foreign currencies and delaying, delaying trade payments, etc., etc. So I'm delighted to have all our, uh, all the, our esteemed panelists uh, join us, and they're going to bring different perspectives. So the policy side uh, on, um, the policy side on, uh, from, from Silver and, uh, and Eden. Then we're going to get a macro uh, perspective from uh, Razia, and then really uh, what it truly means from a private sector perspective from both uh, Monica and, uh, and Rene. So we'll start with, uh, with, uh, with Silva. Um, so Silva, can you tell us where we are? So you're now at the Secretariat. Uh, we're supposed to get started on the 1st of Jan. Uh, so how are we faring? Are we on track? And uh, are you confident that the negotiations are moving in the right direction? and that they're going to be uh, effective on the 1st of Jan. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Invest in Africa for organizing this webinar. Uh, probably let me start by saying uh, that there are reasons behind the African continent. You know, this part of then running down to the 1980 Lagos Plan of Action. To the 2000, um, the Treaty of Abuja that establishes the African Economic Community. So the African Continental Free Trade Area is um, an actualization of uh, the Abuja projects for the African Continental uh, for Agenda 2063 of the African Union. Now, what is it? Uh, why uh, was there a drive by the heads of state to fast track the establishment of the African continental free trade area. We are dealing here with 55 countries, some of them small, some of them big, 
and um, you know because of the balkanized markets the division in markets um, you know you find uh, small countries of 1.2 million people with probably a GDP of less than 10 billion dollars uh, uh, you find big countries like uh, Nigeria, over 200 million people, Egypt, over 100 um, million people, um, South Africa with about 50 million people, uh, with bigger GDP. So what we are trying to do here in the African continental free trade area is to bring together this balkanized market, these small markets, into a bigger market that can make economic sense in terms of trade, but more importantly, in terms of investment, because it makes better investment sense to best invest in a bigger market of 1.3 people, a market of 1.3 million or 1.2 million people. So this is the reason for the FCFTA existence the balkanized market, the smallness of our markets and the smallness of our economies, that investors would not look at it in a more economical sense to invest in a small market. So this is the reason why we're there. And before we started, an analysis was done to find that um, in, in, in trade, intra-Africa trade, was in 2012, when we started to do the to talk about the boost in intra Africa trade, the trade intra Africa trade was about 11, 12, 13 percent maximum. By the time we started the negotiation, we're building up to about 16, 17 percent, 18 percent. Now, what are we aiming to do with the African continental free trade area? Is to double, make it 50 percent, 35 billion dollar added onto intra Africa trade annually for the next uh, about uh, maybe 10, 15 years. So we are looking at 35 billion annually um, per annum. So where are we uh, right now in terms of the African continent of free trade area? You all know that we concluded the negotiations for the framework agreement, which is the agreement establishing the African continent of free trade area, along with three protocols the protocol on trading goods, the protocol on trading services, and the protocol on rules and procedures on the settlement of disputes. Now, those are the three protocols which form an integral part of the framework agreement that was signed in March of 2018. Now, out of the 55 African countries, 54 have signed the agreement except one. The exception is Eritrea. It is only Eritrea so far which has not signed the agreement. And out of the 54 that have signed the agreement, 28 instruments of ratification have been deposited with the African Union, with the chairperson of the African Union. So we have 28 ratification, 54 signatures, 28 ratification. Essentially, in the spirit of the negotiations, it is the 28 that would now begin to actively trade on the 1st of January because they now become the state parties. It means they agreed to everything and their parliaments have endorsed the agreement. So we have 28 ratifications, 54 signatures, 28 ratifications. Where are we? We are also still in the negotiations of the tariff offers because the tariff offers have not yet been finalized. The modalities of the tariff offers were finalized in 2018, in November, December of 2018. The modalities for the tariff offers were finalized. And um, what do the modalities look like? The modalities say 90% of the tariff lines will be liberalized from the beginning of the trading. That 90% percent will be liberalized over a period of five years maximum. That means that if you are leaving 10 percent duty on a product, on 1st January you begin immediately to reduce 2 percent from the 10 percent, 2 percentage points go off. So that means that you, are, uh, you, you now levy 8 percent duty on that product because it's a linear um, um, reduction of, 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 of the tariff, um, you know, the tariff charges. 
So that is that. So 90 percent. Then we have 70 percent, which is classified as sensitive product. Now the 70 percent tariff lines are sensitive product, which are to be liberalized over a period of 10 years to 15 years, depending on the category of the country, least developed or developing. And then we have 3 percent tariff lines, which are exclusion, but which are as subject to review after five years. Now, so how are we going to achieve this? I have talked about the tariff liberalization, which we expect to start uh, on the 1st of January 2021, when the tariff offers have been made. So the tariff offers is what is right now standing in the way of beginning to trade. But we have this couple of months which we that in the two months and a half, with the support of partners and the agreement of the member states that, you know, the the, the being explored. Actually, next week there is a meeting to determine and to decide whether to continue the negotiations um, online in order that we have uh, something conclusive by the 1st of January 2021. I think for the time being, uh, um, Mr. Omar, I'll leave it uh, at that and I'll, I'll be happy to field um, any questions. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ojako. If you can switch your cameras on speaker so that we can see you when you're speaking. But I've actually got a follow-up question, Mr. Ojako, which is on the 1st of January, uh, so uh, next, uh, next year, what's going to change? For All right. Uh, what will change on the 1st of January for um, African businesses? is that uh, any product that is an African product or qualifies under the rules of origin will immediately begin to receive preferential tariff rates when those products get to the border. We have a, a practical example. You know, I was um, overseeing the implementation of Comesa in my country of origin, which is Uganda. And in, in the year 2000, the United Republic of Tanzania decided to pull out of the Comesa. And I was in a meeting and at the customs post at the, at the border of Uganda and Tanzania, I get a call from the customs officer at the border asking me what should we do with the Tanzanian products that have arrived at the border because Tanzania has pulled out of the, out of the Comesa. Should the products continue to enjoy the preferential treatment or not? So, as of the 1st of January, when the originating African products get to any border of Africa, of any African customs uh, territory, those products should immediately begin to enjoy the preferential tariff regime. That's what is going to happen on the 1st of January. Over to you, Omar. Fantastic. So I'm going to go to uh, Adam next to, uh, to comment on what, or what Mr. Ojakul is, uh, has said and what you expect from a private sector perspective to be uh, the benefits from the 1st of January. And if you can switch your camera on, please, Adam. Thank you. Uh, and as far as benefits, uh, we, of course, are pro-champions, which represents a multi-stakeholder uh, enclave of uh, various business associations and also organizations, uh, and also in collaboration with uh, some of the DFIs who are our partners and members, we the expectation is that because it's private sector that trades and 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 and, and governments really role in this and the member states is to really negotiate. Uh, there's a responsibility for us to understand and educate ourselves on uh, the benefits and the opportunities that CFT offers, and begin to encourage our partners and members uh, to to sort of derive the full benefits of it. What do we expect to see? Uh, because the, uh, the most of the SMEs, uh, as well as also the multinationals who cross border operations and investments uh, are moving people and are moving goods and are moving services all across the continent. Now you will imagine that in the last 15 to 20 years, we've seen the emergence of African multinationals, but also global multinationals doing business in Africa that have uh, integrated into markets and breaking a lot of the barriers to intra-Africa trade, uh, language, regional, among others. Uh, our sense is that 
we should see more of those. And CFTA definitely affords us the opportunity to begin to see lower costs in doing business across borders. Uh, the other element we are hoping uh, to see a lot of uh, uh, you know, benefits is in the area of customs. Uh, the way our borders get clogged up uh, with goods staying at borders for lots, I mean, days and sometimes weeks just to cross borders. Uh, and for truck drivers who are to move, sometimes go in day and come back, uh, and trips that are supposed to be done in, say, a day end up uh, lasting uh, a week. Uh, we are hoping uh, that this uh, implementation or operationalization of the CFTA will enable, uh, we'll see a great reduction in that and, and, and cause people to have. The final one is also is going to be in standards harmonization. I think for SMEs who are producing goods and are expecting to move them across borders but do not have the capital to go registering uh, goods in every other country, uh, just to be able to move those goods uh, and rather have to compete with other companies uh, overseas who are able to bring their goods much cheaper and easier to those uh, those countries. Uh, we think that there's a benefit to be derived from uh, an SME in, uh, say, Togo, uh, uh, producing, you know, uh, peanut butter, able to uh, sell to Botswana without having to go through uh, the rigorous processes of having to re-register those goods and products again. So standards, harmonization, customs, uh, and cheaper uh, or, or, or more cost-effective ways of moving uh, goods across the continent is what we would expect to derive. Of course, we know there are still challenges in infrastructure. Uh, as you, we realize that a lot of the multinationals that were able to move goods and services across the continent had to go into all these countries individually to register their companies and deal with various regulatory bodies in those countries. Uh, we're hoping that the CFTA will uh, provide the opportunity for people to deal with regional regulators as opposed to having to go to all these regulators to get their businesses done. And you will notice that it was already, it was mostly services, like financial services, goods, uh, I mean services, and also, uh, I mean, consulting businesses, financial institutions, they were the ones we saw moving across borders uh, very quickly, banks among others. But when it came to uh, the companies that were manufacturing goods, they faced serious problems in infrastructure, you know, because it was very cost, uh, very costly to move goods from one country to the other without the right kind of infrastructure. So as investments continue to go in that area, uh, goods are still going to be a challenge. Uh, shipping, uh, 90, 80 to 90 percent of uh, our goods are maritime, and hardly any vessels uh, that are connecting uh, most of our countries. So those are areas that we are still going to be facing challenges, but our expectation is that there's going to be reduced costs in moving goods around physical land borders, and more importantly, uh, in, in being able to uh, reduce costs in standards of products that you need to uh, uh, register in other countries. Thank you. Tell me very quickly, uh, Adam, if I can stay, stay with you. So um, the benefits from an SME, so a uh, business with like 50 employees based in, as I said, Togo or Ghana, I mean, when will they start seeing the benefits? It's going to take, what, six months before they get their head around it, uh, that they see the opportunity, it's going to take a bit longer. And, uh, and in terms of uh, GDP points, I mean, what are you, uh, what, what are you ex estimating over the next uh, six months, one year, two years? Quite hard to tell. I mean, it all depends on the, uh, the efforts we put into sensitization and education, Omar, because uh, quite frankly, the, the, uh, even up till now, I mean, we've been engaging, uh, you know, lots of uh, SMEs in various uh, industries. Uh, so if you take the cotton to textiles uh, industry, for example, uh, just by, you know, uh, we talked about local content earlier, just by adding value to the kind of uh, uh, cotton that leaves Uganda and, and, and Kenya, I mean, in Uganda and uh, uh, Benin and Burkina and all these places to, you know, just by adding value, you trip, I mean, you, we, we quadrupled the number of jobs we create and also the GDP immediately. Uh, but that value, that investment into value addition is not taking place. The agreement that is being currently offered should give us the opportunity to do that, but that people are aware of how they take advantage of those opportunities. So if I'm an SME in Benin or Togo, uh, my expectation from currently is that I'm able to sell my cotton, but if there's a deceleration in the demand for my raw materials, uh, which COVID now presents, it forces us now 
to look for new markets. And we've seen that happen with COVID, where people are now producing locally and 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 and, and finding reasons to to add value to their resources locally to meet the demands uh, currently on the continent. So six months uh, all depends again on how informed they are. Uh, I think there's a lot more pressure now uh, with the current dynamics with COVID for people to look more within. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that within the next six months uh, uh, to a year, uh, certain industries, particularly in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the food agro-processing, uh, the, the, all the, the, the products we need for our survival, you know, medicines, uh, 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 cotton to textiles, so what we wear, what we eat, uh, and, and probably even in the area of housing, we should be able to see some benefits. And uh, hard to put a figure on the GDP, uh, uh, but I, I'm very confident that uh, the, the, the countries currently uh, should, especially, what does all the countries in Africa hold in common? S straight deficits. You know, we, we, we import way more than we export. Uh, and, and, and I know we have Rene in the house. So uh, we're hoping to see more of us uh, producing locally and being competitive and the fragmented nature of our economies as uh, our brother Silva spoke of earlier makes it hard but once this agreement comes into force people are more sensitized and understand the opportunities and how they can take advantage of it I, I'm sure there'll be a lot more uh, value we can get from this how to put a figure now though thanks okay, I've got one more question for you actually please Adam uh, so Adam you know I've known you for a few years now and you're not just an Afro champion, you're an Afro activist, you're a true campaigner. So uh, what do you want, what, or, or what's the advice that you would give to business in terms of, to make the AFCFTA work, it's not just about policymakers putting something in place and saying these are the rules. It's also about business making sure that these rules are properly implemented, that their governments are doing the right thing in terms of uh, easing border controls, et cetera, et cetera. So what lobbying would you like to be done by businesses to make, to make sure that the AFCFTA is a success ultimately? I think it's a brilliant question of mine. I think for me, that's probably the most important thing about this agreement. Uh, for a continent that has a track record of uh, coming up with resolutions and conventions, but just never really implementing them. Uh, and, and partly in part because just, just a siloed uh, you know, reality uh, that exists where uh, the, the, those formulating the policies and the agreements uh, are basically not involving or have not involved in the past uh, those who are really going to be the implementers of, uh, of whatever policies are put in place. And this is also in countries as well and not just on the continental level. And you also have a situation where, uh, you know, those in the private sector continue to see uh, uh, those in governments as just people who formulate policies, those in governments, those in the private sector, people who just want to amass wealth and make profits. As long as they don't see the agreements to be, I mean, as long as they see it to be inimical to their interests, in the typical case, it's a Yamosukra agreement, for example, for Open Sky, uh, there's, there's no incentive for them to promote it, to implement it. I think what the CFTA presents now is that opportunity now for us to work together uh, uh, to, to ensure that this happens. So my, my, my advice to private sector would be that they should see the CFTA as being not just uh, an agreement, but, an, uh, but, but, but a sort of legal instruments uh, that need to be enforced. And, 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 and they come with rights, they come with rights. And, and if the private sector can understand these rights and hold the governments accountable to these rights that are stipulated in the CFTA, uh, if, if we don't do that, you know, they, they, they are not going to be implemented. So understanding the rights and ensuring that governments are held as a very strong lobby vehicle. I mean, you look at the turnover of a country like, uh, I mean, a company like, uh, uh, Apple, uh, for example, uh, or, or, or Amazon, you're talking about what, trillion dollars? Uh, but you look at the GDP of, uh, say, a country like Kenya, for example, you know, $80 billion, you know. So, I mean, th there is a strong sense of bringing private sector together to influence these policies and agreements in a way uh, that inure to the benefits of, uh, you know, the, the people. And also make it important for them to also begin to bring those lower, like SMEs and others, within the value chains of these multinationals and make us competitive globally. So, so understanding the rights is important, holding governments accountable to these rights and ensuring that uh, there's, 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 these agreements are, are not inimical to the interests of those who are supposed to be the implementers. And finally, in, in implementing these, I mean, uh, the, uh, the, these, these agreements, 
There is also the need for uh, the, 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 the constant collaboration between the public sector and the private sector to build also capacity so that the capacity that exists in the private sector can also be lent, I mean, or, or offered to the private, I mean, the public sector to ensure that they are also making sure that the rules that they put in place are in order to the benefit of those who have to implement them. Thank you. Thank you. Razia, I'll uh, come to you next, if you don't mind. If you can please switch your microphone on and the, uh, the camera and the tech team will put you on our main screen. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask you, it's uh, because uh, it's, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. But uh, as an economist, when you are looking at uh, countries, economies, when you're looking at forecasts, do, does a regulation like the uh, AFCFTA come into play in terms of your modeling? But I think at this point, with an unprecedented amount of uncertainty, it is very important to have a clear sense of what kind of a difference this is likely to make from the get-go, or whether it's a process that is going to take some time. The earlier speakers who have discussed this with us today have said very clearly the ultimate ambition is around the dismantling of those tariff barriers to create bigger markets that will over time attract hopefully greater investment and lead to greater generation of economic activity. All of that is important, but there's also a need for realism as to how much changes from the very outset. This is going to be a multi-year process of gradual tariff dismantling. As much as the intent to go in this direction is good, we also need to place it in the context of where Africa as a region is today. We know that as a result of the COVID-related impact, we are seeing much weaker rates of growth across a number of different economies. We're seeing outright contractions in the bigger economies, Nigeria, Q2 GDP, a contraction of 6%. South Africa being released just yesterday, very much concentrated weakness in the second quarter, but a contraction of as much as 17% for that particular quarter. The difficulty facing not just African economies, but economies globally at this point, is how do you stimulate growth? How do you reignite demand? And the point has been made, it's a very fair point, that there is a big disparity in terms of the tools available to policymakers in developed countries versus developing countries. For countries that have the ability to put in place much easier monetary policy, that have the ability to pump additional liquidity into their economies, have the depth of capital markets to be able to create much more of a stimulus, they have been able to offer more stimulus and more support to growth. In Africa, we know because of the weaker growth profile that we've seen in the region, it isn't just the impact of COVID. We have seen weaker growth since the late 2014 collapse in oil prices. We know that this crisis comes at a particularly difficult time. Not only were many governments under pressure to reduce their fiscal deficits, to achieve some kind of meaningful consolidation to bring down excessively high debt ratios, it wasn't clear what was going to be leading to that boost to growth. And this is where the Continental Free Trade Agreement becomes very important. What we're seeing globally is something of a retreat from globalization. The big concern is this ratcheting up of trade tensions. Whatever the geopolitical drivers, do they go away entirely? Can we say for sure that we're not going to see the kind of favorable global growth backdrop that we saw from 2001 on, when countries were integrating that much more, were trading that much more with each other? In Africa, there has been a very conscious political decision to say, this is beneficial for the region. Of course it is. One of the big drawbacks in terms of the ability to attract FDI has always been the relatively small size of the different economies and the fragmentation of those economies. It becomes very difficult to offer to potential investors the scale opportunity. Costs are high, there are a great deal of frictions, it becomes that much more difficult to do anything. Just the intent to dismantle that is good, but there needs to be a sense of realism that this is going to be a multi-year process of tariff dismantling. 
you do not get the instant difference being made to growth prospects on January the 1st, 2021. It also comes against the backdrop of a very deep economic crisis. And even though over the course of 2021, we'll likely see a technical bounce in growth, we know that the medium term looks a lot less certain. All of that said, the world economy, African economies are in need of additional stimulus and liberalizing trade is an excellent way to be able to try to put in place the building blocks for future activity, future demand growth, future economic prosperity. Uh, I've got a couple of questions or confirmations, let's say. The first one, so really the biggest challenge, I mean, the FCFTA is great. Uh, and from an economist's perspective, we need to make sure that, uh, oh, we need to see it work before we can assess it. But really what we definitely need to work on as different African economies and governments is uh, how we're gonna, where we're gonna get the money to, uh, to put these fiscal stimuli in place uh, across, uh, uh, across the continent. That's a very good question. So uh, the big, issue of course is that space to provide the stimulus central banks across the region have reacted very well in terms of the monetary easing they have tried to make the conditions for credit growth that much easier the problem is when faced with a shock like this demand for credit is necessarily going to be weak what is needed is the creation of some kind of confidence the belief that there is something positive happening that is going to lead to greater opportunity and will therefore or generate in itself the demand for credit. But you raise a very key point, and this is, we've seen almost across the board, a sharp fall off in fiscal revenue. There were concerns around how African economies are going to be able to achieve the fiscal consolidation in the past. Now the big concern is, well, the situation is made that much more difficult. And this is where market access becomes all important. We know that with the G20 debt service suspension initiative, this has been hugely topical. The argument that there should be some degree of multilateral, bilateral creditor, debt service suspension for African countries, and at a time of incredible fiscal strain, this is of course very important for governments to be able to react to the healthcare crisis, to be able to put in place any kind of buffer to support their economies, lives will depend on this. But there's the bigger issue to be addressed, which is how do you regain the confidence to ensure ongoing market access for borrowing countries? which arguably is as important. Now, there's been a lot of debate about the nature of private sector participation. It's very difficult to arrange with private sector creditors when the time frame is so short. There's also the very important issue of whether this might be construed as a default and therefore have longer term adverse consequences for borrowing countries. But at the same time, we also know that an unprecedented amount of liquidity has been created by global central banks. This is being pumped out into their own economies in the first instance. Some of the recent equity market strength that we've seen is a sign of this liquidity. And eventually that same liquidity is going to be seeking out higher returns. This could be a key opportunity for African economies. We know that spreads have narrowed meaningfully since the heightened volatility that we saw in March, perhaps at the peak of the COVID crisis. And this reflects the policy response put in place. But we haven't yet seen significant new inflows into the debt markets of different African sovereigns. And we haven't yet seen any new issuance from a sub-Saharan African sovereign. And this is the concern. How open are markets really towards that borrowing intent? When do we see a proper normalization of activity? Earlier, different speakers spoke about the constraint of infrastructure. A lot of the legacy infrastructure that we see in sub-Saharan Africa especially stems from colonial days when trade was very much about extracting commodities and making it available to the rest of the world. There isn't necessarily that enabling infrastructure to enhance intra-regional trade. 
But this could be the big opportunity with the intent to dismantle internal tariff barriers with the creation over time, it is going to be a gradual process of much larger prospective African markets that also needs to be the enabling infrastructure. But this raises the all important question of how is it going to be financed? Who is going to be financing it? Fantastic. I mean, it's always uh, wonderful listening to you, Razia. It's so enlightening. So I'll have one question, one uh, final question. Um, you spoke about we haven't seen any sovereigns going to market, and uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, I understand that the I understand the dilemma that they're uh, they're at. They're asking for debt, not not relief, but uh, moratorium on one side. But obviously, and then they uh, they need their, they need they need revenues on another. But uh, what about uh, the uh, we've seen the AFDB go to market. So what about the development banks and uh, new uh, new vehicles so that we can uh, bring this uh, or tap into this liquidity? Well, the hope is that eventually we see enough of a normalization. Certainly, the liquidity is there. It's a question of when we see markets operating in a way when new issuance is going to be made possible. Multilateral development banks would be a start. But the hope is also very much, given where the infrastructure has to be built and where the costs are likely to be borne, the hope is that individual sub-Saharan African issuers will soon be able to tap into this. This is a key point for investors. If we're looking at the broader, medium-term drivers for growth, something meaningful is changing in Africa. We've long spoken about some of those long-term drivers, the demographics being favorable, the pace of urbanization, people and higher populations moving from lower value added activities to higher value added activities. The trade liberalization that is proposed is potentially a very important driver of future growth trends. And to the extent that that improved growth prospect can be built into expectations, one would fully expect it to have some bearing on the ease of being able to borrow. I think you had a question, Omar, around the risk premium that investors currently demand. A big part of that risk premium is the uncertainty around medium term growth prospects. But really, it's the full focus is going to be on the ability of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement to be made meaningful. You know, it's one thing to say a five year period for the dismantling of 90% of the internal tariff barriers. And if you go very slowly for the first four years, and maybe there's a little bit of action right at the back end of that. Sorry, in the current context where urgent growth stimulus is needed, that's just not going to be fast enough. So very much looking forward to hearing from Monica and other private sector participants about how this might be changing their investment plans at the very outset. Are businesses in Africa seeing considerable change, rapid enough change for this to be able to lift activity, to lift economic momentum in the near term? This will be closely watched by many different participants. Fantastic. Thanks for asking my next question. So, Monica, the floor is yours. Uh, so, really, I think what uh, what Razia wants to uh, know is how will the AFCFTA change your outlook in terms of uh, investment, also in terms of uh, raising capital to grow your businesses. So, what uh, what are you planning for? And also, if you can talk to us about the difficulties exporting to Malawi, importing from South Africa, that you mm -hmm. face given the uh, the current new normal, the current realities of regional trade during COVID. We can great. please go to uh, Monica. Um, thank you very much for those really great questions and actually for Razia for actually setting the platform. I think I, I would prefer to st take a step back just to give people a context of uh, where I am located and the business I run. And then I could talk about the current realities that we're facing, one because of COVID and our expectation of um, the CFTA. So uh, I run a, a business called Java Foods, where I'm a food manufacturing business started on the premise of using uh, locally um, uh, acquired uh, raw materials here in Zambia. Zambia grows very well maize, soya bean, as well as wheat. 
We use quite a lot of wheat for our products. Our leading product is an instant noodle brand. But to give you context, um, Java is the only instant noodle manufacturer in Southern Africa outside of South Africa. So Java Foods, when we set up the business, was very well placed to look at a wider market. Zambia is a very small population, about 18 million people. But our, our, our discussion with our investors was actually, we are looking at the Southern African market where we, we, do, we do not face competition. So is easier said than done. And this is pre-COVID, of course. When we started uh, looking at exporting, what we were really faced with was every country had different standards for food had different standards for labeling and packaging, had actually, they wanted certificates of conformity even before you exported. And every export had to be accompanied by this certificate of conformity, which cost $250 in some country per export, right? Um, and then you had to go through the long paperwork, depending on which border you use, depending on your transporter, and sometimes your goods were stuck at borders. So in actual fact, the great dream was actually frustrated because Zambia being landlocked, we have actually nine uh, countries surrounding us. It seemed practical and a great idea, but it was actually really hard to implement. And of course, this year we're faced with COVID. And what happened for, for us is that there was a unilateral closing of borders around us. And we are a key importer of inputs for a lot of our products. And, they became, and there was this great fear about how we were going to then feed not only Zambia, but some of our customers outside of Zambia, if we were not able to actually bring in inputs into Zambia because our neighbors were acting unilaterally. We were not discussing how there was going to be a movement of goods into countries, particularly for food, because of the fear of COVID. This has had lots of impacts, not only on supply chains, but on things like depreciation of the currencies. As you know, a lot of the currencies in, on, on the continent, particularly in Southern Africa, have depreciated Zambia as much as 30%. And this has a huge impact on, um, on food imports because many of the countries in Southern Africa import food. So for me, as a, as a local uh, manufacturer, it's a great opportunity, actually, because it means that now we're thinking that we have to be smart, that you will have a food crisis if we do not support local production. And this is what we're seeing, and we're talking more about this. However, I think what we still need to, we still need to discuss is although the CFTA is being, is being implemented, and I completely agree with Razia, it is going to take quite a while for one, countries to fully understand how to implement it, understand, actually even educate customs officials, educate, I mean, even just for me to get information on how to export to Malawi is such a nightmare because everyone has different systems, different platforms, different forms, you know, just it's a, a lot of work to just export to one country, right? And we're a part of SADC, which supposedly works better. I mean, last week I was a part of a virtual trade, um, summit with Botswana, and then I was being asked, well, how can you export to Saku? Because Zambia, you're not part of Saku, and Saku has a preferential arrangement for South African products. So still, we need to harmonize this, see how it's really going to work with existing preferential agreements, and then also educate not just the private sector, but also the public sector on how we're going to manage it. As a food producer, some of the issues I still face is around harmonization of standards, particularly around food, the cost of distribution. So a great discussion uh, uh, we've already been talking about infrastructure, which uh, it'll be great to hear a lot more about this because one of the largest costs for us is distribution. We're seeing that we can sell X factory, FOB, and then we have to lump this huge amount of money just to, to transport the product outside of the country. And so we really need to discuss the cost of transportation in order for us to take the benefit of this, of this really great market. Because actually SADC is about 350 million people. It can potentially be a really huge market if we get it right. But I think we really, my expectation is we'd love to see how we're going to address not just tariff barriers, but non-tariff barriers. And those ta non-tariff barriers are things like certificates of conformity, things like fining us for you know, certain papers not being available, or changes in legislation which has not been 
been actually explained to any of the exporters. We just find out there's a new document that is needed. So hoping that, you know, the CFTA will now streamline this. I mean, that's a really big hope in order to allow us as companies to export more in the region. So I hope I've addressed your questions about um, the difficulties we're experiencing and what my expectations would be going forward. Fantastic. Well, you have indeed. So harmonization and streamlining. And uh, I think, yeah, there's uh, obviously there's going to be a, a transition period in terms of uh, building that human capacity and uh, an understanding from uh, in terms of borders and in terms of uh, what needs to be done. So, uh, so it's interesting because you're saying that your investment model was to uh, service the whole uh, SADC region. But uh, yes. so do you think that the AFCFTA changes anything or not really? It's, uh... No, I, think, I, I totally think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a right time and I'm hoping that other businesses are seeing the opportunity, right? Because now you can actually convince investors that actually there is a framework in place which will, act, which will actually allow for this to be hopefully better. Because we, for instance, we're already part of SADC and you know, when I started the business in 2012, I was speaking about SADC, but it has probably not worked out as well as we thought. But now having, we know some of the difficulties, some of the, the critical issues that we're facing and hoping that the CFTA will now address those, you should actually be looking at a regional market. And I can, again, I can speak for Zambia, being a small market of you know, 18 million people, you really do, in order for you to really scale, it cannot just be about Zambia. It really does have to be a regional play, yeah. Okay, fantastic. And, um, and tell me, so the, the, the current difficulties in terms of COVID, what are they? So a, a few, and I'll speak from the private sector angle. Um, first of all, what we have seen definitely for SMEs, uh, for smaller businesses who are not owned by a multinational, is one is access to um, financing. So there's been quite a drop or a scaling back of investors. I mean, we used to see quite a few impact investors, and now it's kind of, you know, let's wait and see how things ride out. You know, things are a bit rocky. We're not sure that, you know, you can sustain your revenues. You're not, we're not sure about your supply chain. So therefore, we're not actually going to fund some projects. And it's been quite devastating for a lot of the businesses who are trying to scale up at this moment. A great opportunity, but then you can't fund it. Uh, we have seen some intervention from central banks, not enough and still quite expensive, still only looking at loans, so there's no innovation in financing still, despite being a crisis, you think you'll see more innovation. Not, not enough, not enough. Um, also, um, as I said, supply chains, um, although getting better now because I think people are realizing closing of borders is not helpful to anybody, uh, we still need to trade, but you can imagine the knee-jerk reaction in March, uh, in March, April, and May when everything was closed and then we were all stuck and thought, well, I can't get any sugar into the market because the border is closed, you know, um, and that quite, was quite serious. But of course, I think now we're seeing an easing of that. I think now lots of really great discussion about um, support, supporting SMEs on, on again in the food sector around uh, technical support for food safety and quality, because I think some of the issues about local production is really to to scale up to the technical support. And we are seeing a lot of uh, partners and donors saying, okay, how can we support you? So they're now thinking differently about support for, uh, for, for businesses. But uh, I think those are the key ones for me. I think it's um, financing, it's supply chain, of course, on the health and safety side is safety of our staff. But I think those are issues, I mean, Africa has a relatively low low cases, but it's still quite an issue for us about, for me in manufacturing, how to safely manufacture without you know, cross-infecting our, our, our teams. But um, yeah, some of, my, some of my, my core issues, yeah. So uh, Rene, you guys are doing uh, a ton of work, uh, I know around the AFCFTA. You've been some of the, um, the continent's biggest cheerleaders uh, to make it happen. Uh, so what are your expectations from the AFCFTA, both, let's say, short uh, and medium term? Thanks, Omar. So first of all, African solutions to African problems. So we should start making our own equipment instead of relying on Chinese and Americans. And uh, Monica, we should have a chat. Too. I think we have some solutions to help private sector enterprises like yours uh, to help improve manufacturing on the continent during this uh, period. So, Omar, Thanks. back to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much for giving us at Afriexim Bank an opportunity to join this webinar. 
Uh, the AFC, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, pro provides tremendous opportunity for boosting intra-African trade and investments. And as you know, intra-African trade is one of the core pillars of the African Export Import Bank. And as part of our five-year strategic plan, which is dubbed Impact 2021, we actually have a, a whole team dedicated to supporting the private sector uh, on intra-African trade. Uh, uh, and this team was actually put in place about five years ago to um, create, connect, measure and deliver both financing and facilitation interventions to support the AFCTA and ensure that African Union member states and private sectors, including SMEs, like uh, what our uh, sister was talking about, derive maximum benefits from the agreement. Uh, we are very much aware of a lot of challenges uh, that these the private sector companies have. Some of the participants on this forum have mentioned challenges of lack of access to trade and market information, uh, weak industrial bases and a high dependence on commodities. They mentioned poor trade enabling infrastructure. We all know that the gap of financing of infrastructure in the continent is about $110 billion. Uh, for power, for transport, for airports, for seaports, for rail, uh, poor trade facilitation. We all know the issues around customs and logistics on the continent, payment and settlement issues. And I would, when I talk about the interventions of the bank, I'll tell you about what we are doing on the payments platform. Uh, limited access to trade finance. Uh, the gap for trade finance on the continent, again, is estimated about $120 billion uh, a year. Historical trade patterns. Uh, informal trade, 40% uh, of the trade on the continent is around informal trade. Some estimates say between 70 to $140 billion. Lack of quality infrastructure, we've seen again on this call, the lack of harmonized standards and very slow implementation of regional uh, trade commitments. However, I mean, uh, working with the African Union and our partners at the uh, African Continental Free Trade Secretariat, the bank has put in place a number of interventions and support programs to able to help the private sector. First of all, these are some financing initiatives. Uh, we have some funding in terms of loans, in terms of guarantee programs uh, to able to support the private sector. Uh, we actually put ourselves a target of about $25 billion uh, to support intra-African trade as part of the AFCTA. Uh, the bank has been working together with uh, central banks to put in place an African payment platform, the Pan-African payment system called PAPS. The pilot of this project has been launched uh, with uh, West African, a number of West African states, uh, uh, in, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, Guinea, Conakry, Liberia, Gambia. They're doing a pilot of this where African countries can now pay for goods and services using their own currencies and the African Export Import Bank will clear. We hope to expand that payment system across the whole continent as we get more and more uh, central banks onboarded. Uh, trade information and promotion, the bank is also putting in place uh, a trade and information uh, platform to enable to provide market, uh, market information to private sector players. Uh, we've done some work on uh, the due diligence and compliance, which is actually uh, uh, inhibiting trade on the continent. We've put in place a platform called Mansa uh, to help banks uh, foreign investors, uh, local SMEs and corporates to be able to know who to trade with in the various geographies on the continent. Uh, for the governments and the private sector also, we are working with the Secretariat of the Continental Free Trade Agreement to put in place uh, what we call the AFCTF Adjustment Facility. This facility is available both for public sector and private sector. Uh, to the governments and ministries of finance to help them, those who are going to have a shortfall from fiscal revenues, and for private sector to help them put in place the capacity in terms of capital equipment to be able to start producing locally for export into the regions. Um, uh, we talked a lot during this conversation around uh, the challenges with customs and borders. The bank is putting in place an uh, African uh, Collaborative Transit Guarantee Scheme uh, if you take some of the landlocked countries to move goods from one country to another one is quite a challenge. You have to go through a number of custom borders. We are trying to put in place a seamless guarantee scheme where uh, one guarantee program will enable you to move the different borders and avoid the complications with uh, custom systems. Uh, also, we, we cannot have uh, 
uh, we cannot uh, produce without selling. The bank is helping uh, African champions uh, to be able to build an export strategy. If you look at what happened in the Far East, uh, in places like South Korea, uh, they built their economies by having export trading companies who will, who will agglomerate the production of the countries and be able to sell them. So we are helping uh, some of our regional champions to build export trading companies to serve as platforms for uh, exporting their goods domestically and also across uh, in traf the inter-African continent. Uh, we are working with the Secretariat also uh, on policy and harmonization of standards for trade. Uh, we are working on uh, 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 trade carrying infrastructure. Uh, we are working on railway projects. We are working on shipping and logistic projects, uh, one-stop border posts, which will all help uh, the trade on the continent. The bank also engaged with a number of automotive players to put in place an automotive standards and strategy for the continent. So a lot of work is being done to ensure that we do reduce the uh, importation of second-hand cars and things like that on the continent and start building a manufacturing base for automotive on the continent. We're working with uh, some German companies on this in Ghana, in South Africa and in Rwanda, for example. Um, uh, uh, we are also looking at a center of excellence on how to export. As part of our industrialization and export development strategy, we are supporting countries to build industrial parks uh, in Côte d'Ivoire, we have industrial parks that are going on. In Nigeria, we have some. In Malawi, we are looking at building some industrial parks. I think in Togo, we also have some that are also being planned. In Gabon, also, we have some industrial parks we are working on. These industrial parks will serve as basis to be able to transform some of the commodities or the production of Africans, work with export, com export trading companies and send them to markets, either regional African markets or international markets. Uh, you all know what we have done in terms of promoting African trade. We did the first intra-African trade fair in Cairo, in Egypt, I think in 2018, which was hugely successful, bringing together over 32,000 players ex exhibiting their goods and services. We had planned one for this year in September in Rwanda. Unfortunately, with COVID, it has had to be postponed to next year. We're hoping that uh, this Rwanda event again will be a successful one. We're inviting you as partners and African players to register, to join, uh, to come and showcase your own products, participate in some of the exchanges and seminars we're going to have in Kigali in Rwanda. Uh, lastly, uh, we're working with people like EDEM, uh, to set up the what we call a Pan-African Trade Sector Trade and Investment Committee in the African Union, PAFTRAC. This brings together African private sector players, whom we call intra-African trade champions. We as a bank are supporting them by providing financing and also opening doors for them. Uh, uh, for example, the president of the bank on a mission or trade mission to another country will take these anti-African trade champions and ensure that African states and governments provide them with contracts that we would finance. So uh, Omar and team, these are a number of initiatives that the bank is working on to be able to support the a AFCTA. Uh, I've heard a lot on this call about uh, lack of financing. I think there's lots of liquidity out there. Uh, uh, more and more we are seeing very strong African development and financial institutions and banks who are out there to support the CFTA. We think that uh, working together with our partners, we can play our role to be able to support and make sure that Africans can trade easily amongst themselves. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, opportunity again. Omar. Thank you, Rene. Thank you, Rene. Um, I've got a couple of very quick follow-ups because we need to go to the Q&A. Um, so first of all, just for, our, uh, just for all the participants who are on this call, uh, it's funny because uh, I think uh, someone at the Afrex and Bank was uh, complaining about uh, the lack of a uh, work-life balance. And I think the leadership at the bank said, uh, when, uh, when our liberators were uh, freeing the continent from, uh, from, uh, from colonialism, they never complained about work-life balance. We've got an economic war on our hands and uh, we can't be complaining about a work-life balance when there's so much to solve. So I know that uh, you guys at the Afrex and Bank are... Uh, You've got a lot, of, uh, a lot of issues and initiatives to be uh, seeing through. But on the payment platform, which is extremely important, actually, uh, currency is, uh, or access to foreign currency is an issue. And, uh, and I know that, or well, I believe that you're trialing it out in, uh, in a number of countries before rolling it out continent-wide. But when can we expect the uh, payment platform to, uh, to, be, uh, to be on board? 
Thanks, Omar. I, I think at the African Union summit in uh, in uh, Niger, uh, uh, we actually uh, uh, launched the payment platform officially with the AU chairperson and the African Union uh, team. Now, we had to get in place uh, some of the governance. Uh, we're working with all through the central banks and the ministries of finance in the various countries. I think as of now, all the six central banks in the West African pilot countries have signed on to that. Technically, the team is also very ready. The platform is ready. Uh, uh, at the moment, they are just putting in place structures, finalizing HR recruitment. COVID has slowed down a number of things, but I hope that by the end of this year, we should be able to transact on the on the platform and see some trade between those pilot countries on this platform. That would, that would be fantastic. And um, and uh, in terms of, you speak to a lot of international investors, and uh, you obviously bring deals from Russia, from uh, from Asia to uh, to the table, and uh, and you're selling the African story. So uh, do you see an increase in deal activity post AFCFTA or at least an increase in ticket size of the deals or uh, or you think it's going to be a wait and see approach from investors? Well, the, the, the advantage uh, post the, the ACFTA is that we now see a larger single common market. So the opportunity for an investor who was playing in a regional market or play in a lot in a different country, uh, it now widened. That market now widened. So we're actually working with them now to actually have with working with local African partners to either produce in countries and take advantage of that larger uh, economic market. And also uh, this harmonization of standards of trading rules, the breakdown of tariffs creates an opportunity for them to actually reduce their costs if they can produce domestically in Africa. So, for example, if you take the textile or the textile industry, uh, probably uh, producing a T-shirt uh, in China and exporting it now will become more, it's much more expensive than producing than transforming African cotton and producing it in an African country and selling it again across African markets. So we do expect to see that these investors uh, will bring the capital, will partner with the domestic uh, 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 strengths, would increase the capacity, uh, the human capacity and the technical capacity by, uh, by, by us uh, importing the, the capex to be able to take full advantage of the continental free trade agreement on the continent. Thank you, fantastic. So I've been fed a number of questions and uh, there's quite a few going up to uh, harmonization. So maybe we'll go to uh, Silver if he's still on the line. So, uh, okay, there's a number of questions around harmonization. So we heard from, uh, from Monica in terms of uh, some of the challenges that she faces. And there's a question specifically about uh, harmonization when it comes to uh, food standards. And uh, I'm told that there's a, a number of standards. Uh, there's an international food standard. There's the British Retail Consortium who has their own standards as well in terms of applying standards. What, uh, what can we expect in terms of standardization and how do businesses prepare or to be, uh, to be standard ready? Okay, thank you. I, I, uh, probably uh, in answering that question, uh, I would like to first of all say that uh, this uh, on um, sanitary and phytosanitary measures uh, under the protocol on trading goods and uh, that annex specifies a number of things including um, mutual recognition of conformity assessment process uh, and so on and so forth and we expect to have like my colleague from the Afriexim Bank has uh, explained it to you we are uh, we our priority program uh, of the FCFTA uh, for 2021, we have a, a, a program to look at the harmonization of standards. Why this is critical, uh, like uh, Monica Musonda put it, is critical because in the end, if we do not harmonize the standards, this becomes a non-tariff barrier. We've seen it, uh, you know, how 
happen in a number of uh, in a region where I I come from the East African standard, the harmonizing of standards that will ease the, the flow of you know products produced um, from the different member states across the borders. Now, how will it work? We have to bring together the Bureau of Standards, first of all, to gauge what are the capacities that are existing in each Bureau of Standards of each member state or of each region. We also need to look at the RECs. What are the legal, regulatory, and institutional frameworks that the RECs have done in terms of harmonizing of standards and what are the best practices that we can pick from the regional economic communities and transpose them to the African continental free trade area. So there are a number of things that we need to do, bring together the Bureau of Standards or the ministries of agriculture that are looking at the area of sanitary and phytosanitary measures, including technical barriers to trade, because if we are talking about packaging, different countries have different packaging and labeling requirements. So we need to look at uh, the institutional, the regulatory frameworks and begin to see how we can uh, bring harmony. Um, if, for example, uh, one country is producing their products. Uh, maybe you have five, six, ten countries in Africa that are producing their products. Is the standard of the dairy products produced in those different countries the same? What are the conformity assessment procedures for, you know, are they in tandem? Can they, can they be said to be equivalent so that you can then have what you can emit mutual recognition agreement that can say yes the the the, the conformity assessment procedures that are used in uganda are used in south africa are used in nigeria are used in algeria and egypt are the same and then you have the mutual recognition agreement that can say this is a, and that is how the harmonization would work but we have to bring together the key players um including the the standards bureau plus the african uh regional standards organization uh, because that is critical we have a regional body we have an african body in the in the in the name of african regional standardization organization so that this effort can be spearheaded so this is how uh, i think that it can work uh, over to you thank you very much fantastic and uh, so we've got one question for uh, for Eden, and unfortunately we can't take any more questions from uh from participants but um so the maritime sector uh, you mentioned it in your um, in your statement but uh, is the, are we seeing enough reform or enough activity in terms of reforming the maritime sector to uh, because as you mentioned it's uh, it's an important uh, player that uh, or it's an important component to unlock the benefits of the AFCFTA so Adam you mentioned the maritime sector someone wanted a bit more clarification in terms of what's being done for it to really benefit the FCFK and uh, the movement of goods within the, within the continent as well. Indeed, there, and thanks, Omar, and uh, to Epileng uh, for the question. Uh, I must say, though, that Epileng is one of our proud Afro champions who is actually leading uh, an effort uh, to ensure that she's done a lot of work in that sector. Uh, for, for, like I said, for 90% of our goods, uh, uh, that trade uh, are, 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 are moving on the maritime industry uh, and, and hardly do we have Africans owning any vessels that are moving uh, intra-country. Uh, I think it was Razia who mentioned also that our, our infrastructure was built to be able to move goods outside of Africa from mining companies, from plantations outside of Africa, but not to move within Africa. Uh, so one of the quickest ways to be able to start moving goods it's really by air because all you really need is a runway uh, if we can start getting open skies to really work uh, and also to be able to move goods by ships and, and I must say Afro Champions is, is, is putting a consortium together currently uh, uh, to, to partner uh, and have a stake in an international uh, uh, shipping company that will focus mainly on moving goods or aggregating goods across the uh, continent before taking outside and also be able to bring goods from outside. Uh, just to move 
goods currently from a country like, uh, uh, say, Kenya or Mombasa uh, to Central Africa Republic. You have to literally take it all the way down to Cape Town, uh, bring it all the way uh, past Mombasa, all the way to, uh, uh, to, to, to Douala, and then track it all the way to Bangui. Uh, it's just, I mean, so the cost implications are horrendous. And, and, and no matter how much tariffs, uh, you know, those things will just continue to stay on paper until we're able to put investment into that particular sector. So airline industry, for sure, freight, to get us started whilst we're building the infrastructure. But maritime should be a no-brainer. And I'm happy to say that we've started some work in that area. And by the end of this year, but when the goods start, we should be able to have start having some vessels moving on the continent, uh, particularly in that space. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to bring this to a close. Uh, maybe we can have uh, final comments from uh, each of the panelists. We'll start uh, with uh, Monica. And uh, what we can say is, uh, are your expectations uh, positive, uh, moderate, or negative in terms of come 1st of January? Hmm. Let's say I'm optimistic, right? I think what we I would like to see a lot more is a lot more engagement uh, from the public sector as well as the private sector. So we understand uh, what is happening. Um, we educate um, key players understand the, the opportunities, understand what's, what's still to be done, understand if it's going to be um, sort of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If it's going to be phased as well, um, and therefore we, we see the opportunities and we work together to create those opportunities. But I, I wanted to say thanks very much for having me, um, uh, sort of to give a practical perspective of what's happening on the ground, and definitely would look forward to hearing more about financing. I love the way finances always say there's so much money, come and ask us, we'll tell you how hard it is to access it. Um, uh, Rene, uh, it's been an interesting and challenging year. Uh, so, but are you optimistic in terms of 2021 and in terms of what the FCFTA can do? Uh, moderate or uh, or negative in terms of next year and, uh, and the FCFTA? You can't be negative, but anyway, go for it. Omar, we don't have a choice. If we don't face this bull on, face on, we're all going to die. So we can't sit here and wait to die. We have to do something about it. So we are very bullish. Uh, we are very positive. These challenges will come to pass by. We have to be strong as a team, as a family, as a continent, as a people, and stand together as one to find common solutions to our problems. Brilliant. Razia. Optimistic, but I think a very important message is that there really isn't the luxury, as other speakers have already said, to go slowly with this. Ratification, great implementation from next year, but make it meaningful. We do need that demand boost. Anything that helps activity will be useful. Brilliant. Uh, we'll go to uh, Silva first, and then we'll end with Edim. So Silva, in terms of what you've just heard now, uh, do you, are you optimistic that we can make it meaningful and, uh, and effective and uh, solve some of the challenges that uh, or the constraints that we've uh, that have been raised. Thank you very much. Uh, again, let me say that there has never been a better time and a better instrument for Africa. This is the time. This is the instrument. This is the agreement that you have been waiting for since independence. And I would like to ask to urge the private and the banks in Africa, African Bank, African Development Bank, the central banks, the regional development banks, and the private sector itself to be able to push the governments through your respective sector associations, push the governments, push the governments of the member states to shore up the private sector. Actually, COVID-19 is an opportunity for Africa. We also the disruption in the supply chain. And I think that this is the time to utilize the AFCFT agreement to revamp our production systems, to revamp our infrastructure interconnectivity, and to trade better among ourselves. That's what I can say. Thank you. Adam, you've heard from uh, the previous uh, panelists. What have you got to add to that? Only thing to add is that, you know, rather than look at all the reasons why things should not, would not work, 
We should keep looking at the reasons why it must work. Have at the back of our minds what will happen if we don't. Uh, and, and get a sense that now there's some strong political will uh, because what the aid market is dried out. Uh, you know, the, the usual people would go to looking for support or trying to figure out how to keep the oxygen mask on their face first. Uh, so I think we have no choice but to look within. Uh, my optimism, optimism is driven from the fact that there's also a burgeoning explosive uh, youth population that is uh, emerging on the continent that is really well informed and want to compete. Uh, and why shouldn't Africa be uh, the continent that has the youngest population in the world be the center for the most freshest and useful ideas necessary to integrate and unite us? Uh, so I feel very confident that uh, with, with the right partnerships, as, as we see happening currently between public and private sector, uh, we should make this happen. Thank you. But, but, but the message for Monica would be what? Your message to Monica in terms of what can she expect? Well, let, let, let's, let's, let's do exactly what uh, I've said earlier and others have also said, which is that hold our, our, our governments accountable. Because remember, you're the ones providing the jobs. Uh, governments don't trade. It's companies that trade. Uh, so if there's a free trade, uh, you're the biggest beneficiary. And the rules that governments are putting in place must favor you. And the more people who join Monica uh, to be able to advocate to ensure that uh, we don't have to start filling uh, 20 forms, you know, uh, just going from one country and registering so many products so many times. Uh, it holds the government hostage because once people can understand that when you distill that, it affects their day to day. It affects the fact that they have to go queue at hospitals and not have access to basic medicines and all of that. They, they elect the government, but the government must be held accountable to the rights and rules that they put in place, you know. And we cannot sit back and just uh, complain anymore. I think that's become a problem of the past, and that's why. I'd like to thank also Invest in Africa and uh, all of you, Omar, for putting this together because it, it, it helps us move from uh, defensive to offensive, from obscurity to prominence, and, 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 and we must keep doing more of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone. William, over to you for your closing remarks if you want to say any, uh, anything. Thank you, Omar. Um, only to thank the panel um, and to reiterate the point earlier that uh, this this is a, a genuine opportunity on a, at a time when the rest of the world is looking inwards for Africa to truly lead on the global stage and set the tone and, and show that these sorts of deals can and will be done in other way forwards um, and that we will create together multiple wins across the continent. Um, and it's exciting for, you know, organizations like ourselves where we work with corporates, we work with development bodies and donors to drive SMEs forward and, and ultimately create jobs. Um, because that's what this is all about, opportunities, jobs and growth. Um, so we're really excited by it. I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of the um, panelists, uh, the star studied and, and very senior lineup you, you pulled together with us today. Omar. And thank you to you two for steering us through. Um, and all, the, all of those who've been on the line, I know it's not ideal doing these things virtually and the sound sometimes hasn't been great. Um, I'm sure we've learned a lot through it too. Um, but thank you for your time, everybody. And we look forward to an exciting year ahead and getting out of COVID and focusing on, on better and, and more productive times with the free trade agreement. Thank you.